Welcome to the afternoon session of WordCamp Boston 2019. I'm Amanda Giles, and this session is called Using CSS to Update Your WordPress Website. I see a lot of you in the back. Please feel free to come up closer if you can't read the slides. I've also posted a link up here. It's Amanda Giles forward slash CSS 2019, and that will take you to the slide so you can follow along um, at home or on your device. So just a little bit about me uh, in relation at least to my work with WordPress. I've been programming since 1985. I got to use an Apple IIe in elementary school, work in basic and logo. Around 1995, I created my first website. And in 2009, I started working with WordPress. So um, about 10 years, just like this WordCamp. I started the Seacoast New Hampshire WordPress meetup up in 2011. So we meet monthly up there in Portsmouth. So if you're somewhere north of Boston and close to Portsmouth, I recommend looking us up on Meetup and coming up if we have a topic that's of interest. We're also very um, member generated, so if you have a topic you'd like to see, we solicit uh, suggestions, and of course, we'd love people to come and talk. I gave my first WordCamp talk, uh, I guess that should say speech, at WordCamp Boston in 2014, so it's really nice to be back here again. And I also started a WordPress development agency in 2016 called Spark Development. Um, so I work both on my own and with that. And, and at, at this point in my life, 95% of what I do is WordPress-based, usually custom themes and plugins. So a little bit about what we're going to go over today. I'm a big fan of the school of thought of like, show them what you're going to show them and then <laughs> tell them and then maybe I'll review it. Um, we're going to talk about what exactly web pages are and what is HTML because that's critical to being able to apply CSS to them. We're going to talk about the HTML tag syntax. We're going to talk about what CSS is, what it stands for, what that means. We're going to talk about writing some basic CSS, cascading and inheritance of CSS. Doesn't shouldn't mean anything. Doesn't have to mean anything to you now. It will. And applying CSS to your WordPress website. Just to be absolutely clear, some things that you will not learn from me, at least here today. Um, you will not necessarily leave here being an HTML, CSS ninja, um, but maybe you will. You'll be on your way. I'm going to steer away from some of the more advanced CSS syntax because I really want this to be accessible and to give you an idea of what is available to you. It, it, CSS is, is a bottomless pit, so once you learn a little bit in how it works, it's a pit that you can just keep going back to and keep exploring and keep learning new technologies. And the standards also change over years, over the years. New things are introduced. So I'm going to steer away from some of the more advanced things. I'm also going to steer away from SAS or LESS. If you've heard about those, that is a compilation process that lets you write your CSS a little bit differently and have it compiled. It's great for reusability and some other features for organizing things, but it's just a bit out of scope for today. So we're going to start right at the very beginning with understanding web pages. Every website that you've ever been to, the core of that page has been in HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And I say language, but it's not a programming language per se like PHP is. It's what's called a markup language. And it is a plain text document which uses tags to tell the browsers about the content that's within those tags. It tells it about the structure and how to, on a basic level, display that. Every page you've ever been to is HTML. When you put that little HTTPS in the header, that's actually telling your browser this page is going to be hypertext, and that's how you should translate it. When you put HTTPS in, that's simply hypertext, but over a secure connection. So no matter what other technologies are included on a web page, even if the back end is written in PHP, what that evaluates to on the front end is HTML, and that is what presents the content to your users. Even when you use something more advanced like JavaScript or React, at the end of the day, it's still delivering HTML back to your browser. That is what the browser um, uses to actually display the content. HTML tag syntax. An entire HTML page is made up of tags. 
and those tags tell the browser about the content inside them. They're not, these tags are not things that your visitors see. You see them if you look at the text of the page, but your visitor doesn't see them. Every tag word is just a single keyword wrapped in brackets. We'll look at that shortly. And most tags have an opening and a closing tag. So the opening tag obviously indicates where the beginning of the content is, and then the closing tag indicates where it ends. The closing tag looks just like the beginning tag, except it has a slash in front of it. So you can see this example here at the bottom. Oops, sorry, wrong button. There we go, pointer activated. Uh, we have a paragraph tag here, and you can see right at the beginning, this is a very short tag, it's just the letter P, and it's wrapped in two brackets. Our content is in between, so in this case, hello world. It's kind of obligatory uh, CSS intro. And our closing tag is the slash P, also enclosed in the brackets. There are also some tags um, that are an exception to that. They're called self-closing tags. And these are tags that don't have an opening and a closing. They're essentially empty. They have information in them sometimes, but sometimes they don't. So the simplest one I can think of is the, um, oops, sorry, the horizontal bold tag, which puts a line across your page, is literally just HR, and then a space, and then the end slash. So it's only one tag, and your browser knows that. It sees that end slash and knows that it's not looking for a closing tag. Image tag is another one. An image tag has attributes in it, which we'll talk about in a minute, that give the browser more information about what that image should be, but there's no actual other content in between an opening and closing tag. It's one tag, and with that slash, it's considered self-closing. Actually, before we go any further, we do have a nice amount of time to dig into this, and while I can't probably answer every question that comes up, if you feel like a burning question comes up that's gonna keep you from understanding further, please raise your hand and we'll and I'll try to work them in. So the essential tags for an HTML page, uh, there's actually only four of them. If you've ever looked at the source of an HTML page, particularly with WordPress, I'm sure you saw a great many more. But the four core tags that you need on any page are the HTML tag, which defines the document as the web page that's going to be displayed, and all of the other tags go inside there. There's a header tag, which has information about the web page, so that gets nested inside, and it, the information in it does not appear on the page. There's a title tag, and this is the title that's going to appear on your browser window or your browser tab, if you have multiple tabs open. This actually goes inside the head tag, so you do kind of see it, but you don't see it on your page. And then the body tag is where all of the main content for your web page is gonna go. So every other tag that we are gonna include on our page, all of the images, all of the paragraphs, all of the lists will be inside that body tag. I've already kind of referred to this, but tags can be nested. So those four tags that we just talked about in an HTML page would look something like this. You'd have your opening HTML tag, then you have your head. Inside your head tag, you have your title tag, both the opening and the closing. Now you're gonna have other information in your head most likely that goes, that can go before or after it, it doesn't matter where. And then after our head tag, we have our body tag. And everything else for your, for your page is going to be in between those two tags. So they're really the most important tags, and when you're trying to find something on your page, you're always going to be starting in that body tag and looking down if you're looking at your content. Thank you. So some tags can sit on their own, um, but most tags benefit from the use of attributes. And what is an attribute is a piece of additional information that goes along in the starting tag that tells the browser more about what needs to happen. Tags don't have to have attributes. They can have zero attributes. They can have one. They can have multiple. Um, you can even write custom attributes that wouldn't necessarily affect your CSS, but you might use in JavaScript or other programming languages. What are considered valid attributes depends on the tag itself. The 
specification for HTML indicates certain attributes that are that can be used for a tag, and the browser is going to expect to pick, maybe see those attributes, maybe not. But if you put other random attributes on your tag, the browser is not going to recognize them, not going to do anything with them. Attributes are written in the format of the attribute name, an equal sign, and then the value of that attribute, which is wrapped in single or double quotes. And I've got a couple examples here. This top one here, the A href, this is actually a link tag. A stands for um, anchor, and the attribute in this case is the href attribute, which tells you where the link will lead to, where that hyper text, that hyper jump is going to. So in this case, it's a link to Google. So the href attribute is telling us what website it's going to link to. And then you can see in between our opening and closing A tags there, you can see the text Google. So this would just produce a simple word Google with an underline in most cases. And when you click it, it would lead to google.com. Underneath this, we have an image, which we talked about. So an image tag, again, is a self-closing tag. So in order for the browser to know which image it is that you want to display, you need the source attribute. So it's SRC, which is just shorthand for source, equals, and then it's the um, path of the image. And this can be relative. So in this case, I've included a full path that includes the HTTP, the website. It could also be a relative path. So you can have an images subfolder you know, that you can actually reference, and you could just say images slash logo dot png. And if the file was located in that position relative to the CSS file, it would also display correctly. So that's great when you're moving from one site to another. Yes? Same word, the A tag, is that, is that, does that mean something, or is that just an A? So A is short for anchor, okay. um, and it is used for, it, sorry. Most often you see it used for links. Anchors can be used for other things. They can be used to specify a certain point in a page that you can then link to. But A is short for anchor, P is short for paragraph. Most of them are longer and a little more descriptive, but all of the tag keywords are single word, single word keywords. And then the last, um, the last tag we have on here as an example is a form field tag. So this is what's called an input field. This is a spot on a form where you would put, in this case, your first name. And so we have two attributes shown here. There's a text attribute that says, I'm just going to enter text here. I'm not entering some other kind of data. There are some other um, types of input fields you can specify, such as email, which would have a more strict validation on them. But in this case, we're saying we're just putting letters and numbers, text, into the field. And then we're giving it a name, which is in this case first. And so in subsequent code, we would refer to this field and we would use its name. And that's how we would retrieve the value out of this field. Yes? Uh, on the end of the last two, you have slash and then the bracket. You don't have slash IMG in the bracket. Is Correct. that a shorthand? Or? Correct. No. Nope. Um, so the, the first example here, the anchor tag, is essentially a normal tag where you have a starting and closing tag, and the content is in between it. The image tag and the input tag are both self-closing tags, so they're just a single tag. And instead of having, there's essentially no content to put in the in the in the element, and so it's defined to be a self-closing tag. Where instead of having the closing tag, you have that slash right before the end bracket. And when your browser sees that end slash it understands, oh, this is a self-closing tag. I don't need to look for any more content related to this element. So just an example, putting some of those pieces together. And again, if you are, I, I made these as large as possible, basically for what I could fit on the screen. But if you are having trouble reading it, you can go to my website, amandagiles.com forward slash CSS 2019, and you'll be able to see the slides um, afterwards or right now if you're having trouble reading them. So in this example page, um, I've left off the HTML and the head tags, so we're really just starting in the body. So it's not the entire page, but it's a simple representation of what could be a whole web page. So we have our body tag. 
then we have um, this heading tag H1. And there are six heading tags that are used, and they just, they are literally H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6. And they all have an opening and a closing tag because they have text in between. And what these are is these are headers, <coughs> excuse me, this is heading text on your website. So H1 is your largest, usually your largest text, but it also represents the top layer, top level. So if you thought of your web page like an outline, if you had a lot of information on it, you might have a heading one, you might have a heading two for something further down. We have at the top of our page an H1, that's typically what you use for the title of your page. It's the most important piece of information. It's what you want your visitors to see, and it's also what the search engines are going to read. So in this case, we have an H1 tag, which is a normal open and closing tag with our title in between. After that, we have a paragraph tag. But the only real difference here between the paragraph and the H1 is how your browser is going to treat it. So your browser has some default styling, but what we will be talking about is adding additional styling to specify. But by default, your browser is going to make that H1 tag very big, possibly bold. Your paragraph tag is going to be a more normal size. I think in most browsers, it defaults to font size 16 pixels. But then if you up the font size in your browser, then it will up that size with you, so you can read that. Underneath, we have a new tag that we haven't looked at yet called, uh, it says UL, stands for is unordered list. And this is a tag that has nesting built into it. So the UL tag is the outer tag. And then, and the UL tag says we are starting an unordered list here, typically represented with bullet points, but you can customize that. And then the LI inside stands for list item. And so inside our unordered list, we have multiple list items. So in this case, we have a list of our offices across the world. So our first list item is our New York City office, and our second is our Tokyo office. And you'll notice that we have another tag in there, which is our anchor tag again. So this is going to be a link. So we're not just going to see New York City and Tokyo in a list. We're going to actually have that linked to another web page that tells us more about that office. So this is a great example where you can see how these tags get nested. Notice that the A tag starts here and ends here. The list item tag wraps around it. If you were writing HTML, which isn't really our focus today, we're really focused on understanding it and being able to understand the structure. If you were writing HTML yourself, you need to be very careful to keep your tags nested one inside the other. You can't start the list tag and then the anchor tag and then close out the list tag if you haven't closed the anchor tag. The browser's going to be very confused then. It's probably going to close the tag on its own, not necessarily where you wanted it, and then you're going to have an extra anchor tag sitting on the outside that your browser is possibly going to be not represent the way you want because you didn't properly nest those tags. Again, our focus isn't really writing this at this point, but understanding. So understand that these tags always need to be nested within each other. You can't open one tag, open a second tag, and close that first tag until you've closed that second tag. But you can continue to nest tags in. In, in a number of cases. Um, certain tags can't be nested in other tags, but for the majority of tags, they can be nested one inside the other. So after our two list items, this um, slash UL, this is our closing tag for our unordered list. So this is telling the browser, you know, we are done showing our list items, we're done showing our bulleted list of offices, we're gonna move on. And then the next thing underneath we have is another anchor tag and this one is linking, is a link that says view all offices and then is linked to another page that presumably is going to have more general information about every office that we, that we have in our company. And then we have our closing body tag. Questions about this? You don't need to understand every nuance, but does the general flow of the page and the nested tags Make sense? Yes. So it seems like tabbing is very important. Tabbing? Yes. Like these are index. index. OK, so the question was, it seems that tagging is very important. No, 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 no. Tab tabbing, tabbing, sorry. The tabbing is very important. I've got tags on the brain. Um, tabbing, um, as a developer, I think tabbing is very important. When I read somebody's code and it's not tabbed, where it's nested, <laughs> it drives me crazy. 
Tabbing is a useful function to see visually where that nesting takes place. It is not required. Your HTML page can be complete uh, text all mushed together. And in fact, for performance, um, often websites put features on that will strip out all of those spaces. So if you just click view source on a web page, if any of you have done that, you will most often see a whole rash of tags and text that are all mushed together and very hard to make sense of. We're going to look at a tool later that will nest it for us. But when I write it for viewing, I like to nest things. It makes it easier to read. It makes it easier to know where you should be closing the tag. And <clears throat> we're going to look at the browser inspector later. And that will show it to us in a nested format. No matter how it was written, it will attempt to nest the tags for us visually, which is super helpful. Good question. We've talked a little bit about tag attributes. I wanted to just share a couple of them that are uniform that can be applied to any tag that we see. <coughs> Excuse me. So the four, uh, four, sorry. I took one tag core attribute app that isn't used as much. Um, the three core attributes that I'm going to tell you about today are ID, class, and style. And these are particularly relevant to our discussion of CSS. So an ID is an attribute that's used to uniquely identify an HTML element on the page. In other words, there should only be one element that has that specific ID. You can have a number of elements on a page that are given different IDs, but the ID tells the browser this is the only thing on the page. Class is a bit different. Class is a broader designation. You can apply a class to an element and you can apply that class to other elements, and they can appear multiple times on a page. And it, as far as the HTML is concerned, the browser, it doesn't know what to do with that class until we tell it what to do with that class. So the class is specifically for identifying <laughs> elements of a certain type. So if you have events listed on a page, they might all have a class of event so that you could find target those events with your code when we get to the style part. And so IDs are unique, classes are not. The style attribute is the third attribute that you can use anywhere. And this attribute lets you actually apply CSS styles directly to an element. So when we start getting into the CSS, we're going to look at applying CSS broadly to a whole page. But you can actually take the same style declarations that we're going to learn how to write and apply them directly to an element using the style attribute. So some examples just to see this visually. These are just like our other attributes, but as you can see, the ID um, gives a name for an element. So an example up here I have is a form element. That's one we haven't looked at yet. That's any kind of uh, collection of fields where you're collecting data from your user. So every newsletter sign up that you ever put your name in, any you know e-commerce when you go and order something, all of those fields are wrapped in a form tag. By putting an ID on it, the code on the other side, when you hit submit, knows how to access that form and grab the data that you entered. So that ID is used for identification, but we are, can also use it to apply styling. The example below is a div tag, which is a very generic tag that you'll see a lot of. And the ID, in this case, I put jobs list. I didn't actually put the content in there. It's just the opening and closing tag, just to show you how it works. And again, it's just a unique identifier. That ID means nothing to the web browser. It means everything, except when it goes to apply our styles. But on its own, it doesn't mean anything. But it's merely an identifier for that element. Classes are a little broader. They're an identification, but they can identify more than one thing. So in this case, we have our div with our job listing. Under class, the example I put here is a is a, it is another div, but this one is specifically a job listing. So you can imagine how the job list div might contain multiple job listings underneath. And by giving them all a class, in this case, I actually gave it two classes. Job-listing is considered one class. A class can be a single word, or it can be separated with one or more hyphens. And I also added a second class there that says feature. You don't need to worry too much about those specific classes right now, but just to show you that you can apply more than one. And the last thing here is the style 
And this is a paragraph tag. It's another, the standard attribute in that it is the name, equal sign, and then the value. And in this case, the value is an actual style declaration. Uh, in this case, turning the color of the text red. And then you can see after that starting tag, we have the text in error has occurred and the closing tag. So that style attribute is telling our browser, hey, this is some style that we are going to apply directly just to this element, not to any other p tags, not to any other section on the page. I saw a hand go up. Yep. Uh, are those with ID class, are they case sensitive or insensitive? Um, I think, I think they're case insensitive. I don't think they care. Gina, you're going to yeah. yeah, I was going to say, can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was whether ID and class are case sensitive. Um, I, I'm going to reverse that. I think they are case sensitive. They are certainly case sensitive in JavaScript. Um, I always just make them the same case. I'm pretty sure they're case sensitive. Uh, okay. <laughs> that shouldn't have been a trick question, but it was a very good one, so thank you. I don't even think about it because I'm just, uh, I guess as a developer, if you ever do work with JavaScript, Everything in JavaScript is super case sensitive. The first time that bites you, or the third or fourth or 30th, you finally get it, and you just make sure everything is always the same case. Um, I believe that CSS is the same way. We'll have to try it later. So just a little bit to reiterate IDs versus classes. IDs are unique. They can only be used on one, uh, an element can only have one ID, excuse me and they should only be used once per page. You will sometimes see pages where there's more than one element with the same ID, but that's not really valid HTML. That shouldn't be used, and it's a sign that maybe you should have been using classes if that's what's happening on your page. Classes, on the other hand, are not unique. You can, an element can have multiple classes, and they can also be used many times on the same page for different elements. So now we know a little bit about HTML and HTML tags. We're going to talk more about how that interacts with CSS and what CSS is. CSS is a style sheet language that is used for describing the presentation of a document written in markup language. So we just learned how HTML is a markup language. All of their content in it gets marked up with these tags back and forth. So a little less dry. Uh, explanation of this is that our HTML is going to provide the content and the structure of a page, but our cascading style sheet is going to control how those elements are displayed. Just do a time check here. Okay. So, cascading style sheets um, are a language. Um, not a markup language, but they are a style language. And as such, they have their own syntax that we'll learn about. They can also, in the case of a web page, be applied in multiple ways. So you can add CSS directly to an HTML document if you have access to it. In WordPress, that's a little harder because you'd have to be editing the theme usually to do that. You can also directly add them to an HTML tag. So using that style attribute that we just saw, you can apply style very specifically that way. And most commonly, you can also add CSS via an external file. And so you create a file that has a .css extension, and then you link that into your HTML document in the, in the, within those head tags. So when we talked about the HTML structure, we had HTML tag our head tags opening and closing, and our body tags. And our head tag is where a CSS file would get linked in. Um, when the browser sees that, it then knows to go look in that file and apply those styles to the page. So the first question a lot of people usually have is, is why cascading? Style obviously makes sense. We're all used to that as an aesthetic term for how something looks. Cascading is refers to the fact that CSS has specific rules about what priority to apply the style rules. So on the CSS for a website, particularly with WordPress, you'll have many, many rules applying to, to elements. You will have written many rules. Plugin developers add styles that have their own rules. The themes have styles. So 
the cascading part refers to the fact that there's a certain methodology in CSS that is used to determine which style rule is going to trump all of the others and, and take precedence and apply. So in this cascade, uh, priorities or weights are calculated and assigned um, by the browser so that the results are predictable across different browsers and different devices. And understanding how things cascade is really important to not banging your head against the wall trying to add CSS to your website. The essential CSS syntax that we've been kind of dancing around and you've seen here and there is that you have a selector and your selector is usually a tag name but it could include, we'll look at some variations, but the selector identifies one or more elements on your page to which the style is going to, going to apply. Now your selector, if it's written poorly, might apply to zero elements on your page. And that might be correct because maybe you have, a, uh, have written a selector that targets things with the featured class, but you don't have any featured items on your page. That's fine, your style's just gonna sit there, the browser's gonna ignore it. Um, however, if you were expecting that style to be applied, you might be very frustrated because you're like, I see my style there, it's in the file, why is it not being applied? So the selector, we'll talk about in a lot of detail, but it's very important to not only targeting your element to actually get it to have the right priority and have the style applied, but it's also um, very important where the priority comes into play. It might be that your style is being applied, but then another style declaration is deemed higher priority, more specific essentially, and that one will be applied over it. So we have our selector, and then similar to our tag attributes, we have a property name and then a property value. And together that's considered a, a declaration. So on the left here you can see, in this case we just have a very simple one, color, that refers to the text, the color of the text on your site. And then we have a value. In this case this is a, this is a color, but this is what's called a hex code value. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But this is the general structures. We have our selector. Up here, we have open curly braces, we have our property name, we have a colon, we have the value, and then we have a semicolon. And then we can actually have multiple declarations before we put in that closing curly brace. So in this example, we just have the one declaration. We could be applying other styles in here as well, and as long as they're all formatted in this manner with the um, property name on the left, the colon, the value, and then the very important semicolon that tells the browser that you're at the end of that declaration, you can have as many of those as you want. And typically, I do tab them, indent them, as we were talking about earlier, and this can make it a lot easier to read when you're, when you're looking at your file. And also, if you're using certain kinds of editors, you can, when you have things like this that open close, that have a curl, an opening and an ending brace, a lot of editors will let you open and close them. So if you have a whole bunch of styles, you can actually sometimes click on the side and have them collapse up so you can look at other things in the file. So it, it's just a, it's a presentation thing. So the CSS selector is the very important uh, we're going to learn a lot about, it. not a lot, I'm not going to focus quite as much on the CSS properties. I'm going to give you a sprinkling of those later. Basically, anything you think you can update, go search for it. I'll give you some references. You probably can once you find the property. But what's really the important part that really catches people are these selectors and understanding how to apply them. You can write the best style declaration in the world, but as long as your selector is wrong or it's not specific enough, it's not going to apply, and therefore it's, you know, it's not going to change your page the way you want. So the selector is that opening part. It dictates which HTML elements are the target of your style declaration. If a CSS selector is supposed to target every tag on a page, it can just use the tag keyword. So in this top example here, I'm saying all my paragraph tags should have red text. Sounds like a horrible web page to read. Um, so I don't recommend that particular style. However, sometimes if you're testing something, if you're trying to see if a style is taking place and, you know, 
border red, color red. Sometimes these are things you'll, you'll find yourself just throwing in just to see visually if it's working before you go to the, the other tools I'll show you. Now a CSS selector can be more specific. Obviously we can use it to target an ID and when we do that, we're gonna use that ID value that was in our tag attribute. So ID equals, and we had a string there, so one of our examples was like job dash list. So, or in this case, our main body of our page often has an ID of main. So when we put a hashtag in front of that text, that tells the browser, I'm looking for an HTML element that has an ID with this name. Once it finds it then, it can also apply our red text. The, when we use a class, it's very similar. We can use any class that we want on a page to, to identify elements, but we're gonna put a period in front of it instead. So when you're looking in your CSS, when you see periods, those are looking for things with classes, and when you see hashtags, that, re that identifies things with IDs. And they can even be used um, together. We'll look at some more examples there. So the different ways that you can use the selectors are um, tag name, which we already talked about, so a straightforward example of just the P tag, a single element ID, like we looked at with our hashtag name. So in that case, we take, we're taking all of the text in the main body and making it blue. But we can also nest tags. So just like our tags are nested in the HTML document, we can apply that same kind of nesting to our CSS selector, and this is helpful to make sure we're only targeting the specific area we want. So using those nesting tags, um, they can be a double-edged sword. If you put in too many nesting tags, you might overcomplicate and avoid targeting the thing you want, but more often what happens is people apply a very general style, and they put something in and they don't realize it's going to apply to every paragraph on the page. And they're like, oh, no, no, I just want it to apply in this one area. So that's where you would go and look up that chain of nested tags and choose tags to identify. So in this, in this um, well, I have another slide. We'll look at this a little more. But when you do nested tags, you put a space in, and you're basically following that same chain that's on our HTML page to specify. The other thing we can do is we can actually have multiple selectors and apply the same set of style declarations to different kinds of elements that may not be identifiable by the same selector. So in this um, bottom case here, I'm using .home, .page, .post. These are all classes. I can tell that because I see the period there. And when I look in my body um, in WordPress, those are classes that typically appear depending on what kind of page it is. So in this case, I'm targeting the home page, I'm targeting any of my static pages, and I'm targeting my posts. So what I'm not targeting here are maybe my events, I'm not targeting my category archives, I'm not targeting other kinds of pages, but any selector, any um, elements that fit um, either of those three selectors will have that style applied. So nested CSS selectors, they obviously deserve a little more discussion. Um, than I could give them in the intro, but they are to target one or more elements by using those parent surrounding tags that we talked about. So nested selectors are listed sequentially as they appear. It's not just any, it's not either or, it, it has to be starting, starting from the outside in. So in this bottom case, there has to be an element on the page with the class home. If there isn't, nothing else matters. If there is, then within that home element, there has to be something with an ID of main. And then within that, there has to be another element with dot entry dash content. And I chose these particular classes not uh, to be obtuse or anything, but because these are the types of classes and tags you'll see in a standard WordPress theme. And then all the way down to the paragraph. So only the paragraph tags in the entry content element, in the main element, on the home page are going to have the style applied. If there's a paragraph in the footer, still in the home element, that's not going to have. That's not going. To, the style isn't going to be applied. So it, you need enough tags if you're trying to be specific, but you also don't need every tag in the lineage. You don't need every single tag in the order it appears. You just want to identify the ones that really isolate where you're trying to focus. Yes. The previous slide you had uh, a com commas. Hmm? 
Yes. Keep going. <laughs> How, how's that different than the slide you're just showing? So uh, you're at the bottom. You have. So we're going to look at that in a minute. So there are two different. So the nested. So when we put a space, that's when we're nesting the tags, and we're building essentially a chain. It has to be in this tag, and then that tag has to be inside here, and that tag has to be inside here, and so on, for this style to be applied. When we use the comma, we're basically, it's essentially the difference between and and or. When we use a comma, we're saying it can be in, in a, an element with the home class, or the page class, or the post class. So it's multiple versus a nesting. Back in the right direction, okay. So nested tags, so then multiple CSS selectors, which we've jumped ahead to slightly. This is when we want to apply the style declaration to multiple elements. And the selector just tells the browser, oh, okay, we're starting again. So we're not nesting anymore, we're not looking for a deeper tag, we're starting essentially from the top of the page again. So at that very top HTML element. You can use that HTML tag, you could use the body tag, you can use them, um, in combination, so I haven't shown a lot of examples of this yet, but you can indicate tag names and then use that period to indicate only tags with a certain class. But these multiple selectors, that comma says we're starting a new selector. If I had had room, I would have put dot .home, dot .page, and dot .post on separate lines to make it a little more clear. And when I write my CSS, I tend to write it that way. Just, again, that, that clarity. Just like I want to indent my styles, I like to put my selectors on separate lines because it makes it clear to me when I look at it, oh, I'm applying this more than one to more than one place. So cascading and inheritance. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, it's very important, so we're going to talk about it some more. We're going to see it in action. Classes and IDs have different weights. So as you might have guessed, because IDs are unique and classes are not, CSS values IDs more than classes in that if something, the ID will receive priority when it's deciding which style to apply first. So that's one of the rules. Another major rule is that an element that has, I should say a declaration that has a class or an ID as part of it is going to receive priority over one that doesn't. So if I specify all paragraph tags have you know, red, but all paragraph tags with a certain class are blue, then the paragraph tags that have that extra class are going to have that more specific style applied. And it is very much a priority of specificity. The more specific the style is, the more likely that's going to be the one that trumps over another style. If you have two or more styles of the same ID or class selector, so CSS sees them as the same, your browser is like, oh, they both have a class, they both have this style applied, then it's going to actually look at which one is further down in the file. And it, it might not just be one file, you might have multiple CSS files, so it's going to be whichever style is loaded last. So there's a real art sometimes in WordPress to knowing when your CSS is being loaded. If it's being loaded before the CSS that you're trying to overwrite, then you might have to code it to be more specific, but if it's afterwards, you can just be the same amount of specificity, and because you're the last style, you win. So order is also important. And also, a style with more than one class will receive priority over a style with one class. So we're gonna look at examples for all of these, so. So example number one, so the style order that I talked about so at the very top here, I have an HTML element. And then underneath, I have some CSS declaration here. And normally, these would be in separate files. Just understand that they're in separate places. Um, but they're here together so that we can just compare them. So our HTML element here is a div, which is literally just a, um, just a block of text. And it has a class of event. And it says WordCamp Boston. And then it has our closing div tag. We have some style here that's applying. We have two different style declarations. And we have, right at the beginning, we have our dot event is our selector. That's what's telling our browser how we're going to pick something. So right now, it's saying any, any type of element that has a class of event 
you should apply this style. And the style in this case is background color red. But right underneath it, or perhaps much later, is typical, later in some other file down the road, we also have dot event background color blue. Since that one was later, the event's background color will end up being blue. Had that second declaration not been there, it would have been red, it, but it gets applied in that cascade of priority. Yes? So in that example, when would the red color appear? Why would, why would you even? It doesn't by the time the user sees it. But if that style wasn't there, that second style, it would have been applied red. So think what your browser is basically reading these styles, and it's, it's, it's queuing them up. And it says, oh, I have this style that applies here. And it keeps reading, oh, I have some more styles. When it gets to that other style, it says, oh, that style also applies to this element. And it has the same priority. It's not more specific than my other style. It's still just anything with an event. And now it's replaced that other style. It's, it's, it's not replaced, but it's because it's the more recent style, it takes priority over the earlier style, if they have the same level of specificity. So it's in the sequence? So in other words... So the sequence is one factor. So this is one factor. We're going to talk about some other factors. Uh, actually... Yes, the space before the blue on the second one, is that... Um, I'm sorry, can you say that again? The space before the blue on the second one. Oh, the space. Uh, no, that's just a typo. Oh. It can be either way with or without the space. I prefer it with the space. So what she's talking about, I'm sorry, what she was mentioning is, in the second line, I actually have a space after the property name before the value. And in the first one, I don't. I have no space there. You can write this either way. I like to put a space there because I use control arrow to like jump over words in my text. So if I have a space there, it will jump over it. Um, but I make typos. <laughs> Yes, we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> did you go to? I did. Um, so it's it doesn't it, it isn't retroactive though. I mean, it doesn't go back once it reads this blue and go make everything before blue. Well, it's essentially reading all of it before it shows you the page. So you can kind of picture it reading the styles in order and being like, oh, okay, events are going to be red, and it keeps reading, and then it's like, oh, oh, events are blue now. But if it hadn't gotten to that second declaration, events would still be red. Okay, so they do. It does change all of them that were there before. It does change all of them, but it does it before it's showing it to you. So it's um, so the question was, does it change them? You know, does it kind of go back or anything? And it's really just that it, your browser is processing it all. And by the time it reads it to you, it's decided what the most important style to be applied is. Yes? So kind of working <coughs> off of that, then if you really wanted the events to be red, but maybe one event to be blue, then that would be an error then in your coding, and you would really have to change the blue one to be more specific to the one one that you want to be blue? Correct. So the question was, if I really wanted the events to be red, and they ended up being blue, or a specific event to be red instead of blue. Um, the way you described it, if I want a specific event to be red, and obviously this blue code is overwriting it, I would I would want to look at what is it about that event that I want to use to target it. Is it because it's the first event in the list? Is it because it has a certain class or position on the page or something that I can use? And then I would try to write that CSS to be more specific. So if it's more specific, then the one being the last wouldn't override it. Correct. So we're going to look at some more. So ID versus class. So here I have a very similar div. We have an ID of feature dash event and a class of event. And again, just the title WordCamp Boston. That's our content. We have two style declarations. The first one is hashtag featured event. So that's our ID selector and we're making the background color red. Our next style says anything with the class of event, we're making the background color blue. So based on what we've talked about so far, what is the background color of, oops. <laughs> Some teacher I am. Buttons, buttons. Well, if you didn't see that quickly. Um, who, 
what is the color of the of the this element going to be? Blue. Right. <laughs> and why? Right. So it is going to be red for the, for the recording. It is going to be red, and it's because that ID takes precedence. So even though in this case our second statement with blue came second, because it's not as specific, the browser still knows that that first statement takes priority, and it's going to apply that style. Now, in these cases, we just have a single style declaration in these blocks, but we could have multiple, and it's actually property by property. So if in that dot event declaration, we also said our background color is blue and our text is going to be white, that text color being white would actually still be applied because that earlier text declaration says nothing about the text color. So it is on a property by property basis as well. So class versus no class. In this example, we just have class event. There's no ID. We have two statements here. We have the first one is dot event. We're making the background blue. And then for we're making the background red. So based on what we know about the precedence, what is the background color going to be? Red. Blue. So it is going to be blue. If because the the use of a class as opposed to just the tag name is considered more specific, it has greater priority. So because div is just the tag name, it's not a class. We didn't add a class to it. It's not an ID. Um, the dot event is going to take precedence over that. And multiple classes. So we haven't talked much about how this portrays here, but you can see up at the top, I have two elements. The first one has two classes, event and featured, and it says WordCamp Boston 2019. That's where we are right now. The second one just has a class of event and says WordCamp Boston 2020. So our two, um, our two style declarations under here, and I'm testing your sense of color by not making the color color, but <laughs> the first one is dot event, it's going to be color green, and then we have dot event dot feature, the color is blue. So we haven't really looked at this syntax yet, but this is a way to combine classes together. And when you use multiple classes to identify an element, that is another factor that, you're, that you'd be processing with the CSS says, oh, that's more specific. So that's another way to target. So. Some guesses on what's going to happen here. What color are our events going to be? Blue. Are they both going to be blue? Yes, because there's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's a good, right, I meant that. That's a trick question. Um, nope, nope, that's clearly a typo. So what I meant was it to be event featured, in which case, yes, um, the top one would have been blue, the bottom one would have been green. Um, because I made a typo, this will happen to you when you look at your CSS declaration. Um, because I didn't, it's kind of like a trick question. They'll actually both be green because only the top style will apply because that applies to everything with dot event and I did not misspell event. But I misspelled feature. So did everybody see that? So up top here, I actually wrote featured as the class and then down below I wrote dot feature. So I did not actually mean it to be extra tricky, but it is a good, uh, when you are troubleshooting your CSS, yes. this will happen to you. Check your spelling, check your dots and hashtags and, and you know all of these things. So we'll ignore that. <laughs> Wrong answer. Um, and I will, I will correct the slide so it won't be confusing when you look back at it later. So a little bit about color codes. We haven't really talked about these. I don't know how much experience people have. They are, helpful to understand. I'm not going to make you an expert in them, but essentially there are three major ways that you refer to colors in CSS, and they're not the only ways, but they're the three main ones that you will use. First of all, you can use color names. So in the examples that I was using, you noticed I was just saying blue, green, red. These are, there are 140 color names that are associated with a specific color tone, a specific combination of red, green, blue, um, which is what our monitors show us. And you can use those names and know that you're going to get that color. Obviously, people's monitors can differ. That color might reflect a little differently, but it will be the, the same color code. 
Now, 140 colors is not very many if you ask a designer. So clearly, we need more colors than that. So the other, another way that you can designate colors is using uh, what are called hex codes. And they are RGB hex codes. And they're in the format of what looks a hashtag and then um, six letters and numbers. And the first two represent the red value, the second is the G value, and the third, I mean the green value, and the third is the blue value. It's in hexadecimal, so the values are zero through nine and A through F. We do not have enough time to learn hexadecimal <laughs> donation, <laughs> notation, which I could teach you. That's a whole separate class. There are a number of online tools that let you pick a color on a color wheel and tweak it and will give you this code. So it, I, I shared the format with you so you kind of understand it, but um, you don't need to fully understand how the numbers get generated. But if you want to geek out on that, hexadecimal notation is really cool. Unlike decimal, which is base 10, hexadecimal is base 16. So it's 0 through 9, and then A through F are your extra, you know, up through 16. RGB codes with transparency, um, sometimes we use overlay colors on a website. You use something that's uh, transparent, you can see through it. That is done with transparency. It's done in a similar fashion. You do specify the R, G, and B, although this time in decimal notation, normal numbers, 0 through uh, uh, 255. And then you add a transparency value of 0 to 1. So the notation down here is RGBA, and then we have our R value, RG, RB, not in hex this time, in decimal. Same underlying number, but different notation. Thank goodness we don't do it in binary. All I have to say there. And then the fourth uh, part is the opacity. And if you put zero, there's going to be no color there. If you put one, it's going to be solid color there. So if you wanted a very light transparency, you might put 0.3. You're not limited to one decimal place, so you can put 0.1125 if that's the perfect transparency for your, for your piece. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some CSS properties. Just a second, David. And, um, I'm not going to make you experts on all of these. They're just to give you a smattering of the kinds of things you can change. CSS is one of those bottomless pits. And then what we're going to do is we're going to switch to demo mode, and I'm going to show you how you can look at the structure of the page and apply some of these styles. And we'll also talk about how you can do that specifically within WordPress. But you have a question, David? Um, on opacity, opacity, that you can't do in hexadecimal, right? It's no, opacity is a decimal number from 0 to 1. Right, but it's not part of the hex system. Nope, it's just zero to one. Okay. So these are um, some of the CSS properties that you can apply towards text. Again, just a smattering. And some of them can be applied in more than one way. So I've sometimes I've, um, included more than one example of the kind of values you can use. So up here I've got font family. That's going to be the name of the font. You do have to have that font loaded on your site. So you can't just name a font out of nowhere and expect that the browser will bring it in. If it's a font that user has on their machine, like Arial, it will probably show. But if you if you pick like, you know, Dancing Reindeer from Google and you haven't included that font, it's it's still gonna look like Arial or Helvetica or something. So <clears throat> so your font family. Um, again, dependent on having your font included, but you can put names. You also, with the font family, you'll notice that I have a comma here, and I list more than one. This is what's referred to as a font stack. It's essentially, before we had Google Fonts, um, you, you can include fonts on sites, but sometimes, it is, sometimes it's sporadic, or sometimes you were just including fonts you hoped they had. And it's basically, you list them in order, and the first one the web browser can find is the one it will use. So it's a, it's a way of having a fail-safe, like, well, if they don't have this font, I'll use this font. But these days, you don't really need to do this as much because you're going to be loading your fonts on your site specifically, and fonts are a lot more accessible. But back in the day, when we first built web pages in the 90s, you just listed a bunch of fonts, and just hoping that one of them you would have. You list some Mac fonts, you list some Windows fonts <laughs> that look similar, so that hopefully you're not going to end up with Comic Sans oh. you know, <laughs> on your site, unless that's what you're going for, in which case you can put it on there and see. Okay, um, so font size. 
This is, uh, I have it here in 14 <laughs> pixels, but you can also express it as a percentage. And in that case, it will be a percentage related to the font size in the outer container. So it gets a little weird when you start nesting elements if you're applying font sizes everywhere. Um, but it also can be very cool because you can apply a general font size and then in a specific area say, oh, I just want it to be 10% bigger or 20% bigger. And if you change the other font size later, you don't have to, if you're just using percentage, you don't have to change anything. It's still <coughs> relevant. So. Can you say that again? From the, what, what is the, um, in the, the, the lock, highest level called? Yeah, so the question is, what was the highest level called? It's not so much the highest level. It's more just that font size, if you are putting a specific size in, specific font size, it will be that size. But you could also put a percentage, and it will be that percentage as related to the font size of the outer container of it. Whichever nearest outer container has a font size applied, you know, whatever size is applying, will it will, if you do under 100%, it will make it smaller. If you do over 100%, it will make it bigger. If you want to be sure exactly what size it's showing, you can use pixels. And they're, they're both fine. It depends how you, it's just something to be aware of. Typically, I'm using pixels. That helps. Um, time check? You're good. <laughs> no, quarter three. No, I'm not good. I have a lot more to go over. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so font weight, bold. This is another one where it's like I can say bold, I can say normal, but I can actually also use a numeric representation that associates with it. So 400 is actually equivalent to bold. I'm sorry, to normal, and 700 is equivalent to bold. But you might have a font that has semi bold, in which case you might type 600 in instead, and that's the weight of the font. Font color, I've got a color name here, but then also a hex color code. Line height, this is how far between your lines you have. So if you have a line height of one, your lines are gonna be very close together when you have like a paragraph. But if you have say 1.5, that's essentially your you know, one and a half spacing or your double spacing if you do two, like you would have on your, you know, Back in, back in the day in your papers in Microsoft Word. Um, so line height is a numeric, uh, it can be a number where one it essentially represents 100%, or it can be a percentage and you could say 120%. Is there any advantage to using pixels over M's? Um, I do not have time to go over that. Okay. It is a big, long discussion. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I want to make sure we get to some hands-on because I've drilled you through a lot of slides and a lot of dry things as a basis, but I want to make sure we pull it, pull it all together. So text transform, um, this is obviously going to make your letters uppercase or lowercase. You can choose capitalize, which will just capitalize the first letter. Text decoration underline, you can also do overline or line through. Again, just styling your text. Letter spacing actually spreads out your letters, as it might sound like, so if you do a letter spacing in one pixel, your letters will be very slightly spread out. If you do three pixels, they'll be, you know, possibly off the page entirely. So it, it's uh, something to be careful with. Width and height. So many elements you can apply a width to. You know, when uh, oftentimes when we're using columns, we're applying a width, although there are some new technologies too we're using. Um, but you can apply width to, to images, to any kind of block. You can apply width in a percentage of its parent element. You can apply width as a set width of pixels. You can say width auto, which is just make it the width that the content is, whatever width that happens to come out to. It's, um, and then we can apply, in the same way, we can apply a max width. So you can cap something and say it can't be bigger than this amount. Typically, your images and such, you would say max width 100%, because otherwise, if you load a really big image and you're on a laptop, the image is halfway off the page. You have to scroll to see the rest of it. So max width 100% is one that's commonly used on images. Height is a little less commonly used and is a little trickier with CSS. Um, again, it could be a whole other class along with um, some of the other fi finite. But um, height is not as often used, and it's a little more fickle in how it's applied and whether it does what you think it's going to do. It's typically easier to focus on width and keeping something in a page or in proportion and just understanding that the height is going to go along with that. Um, but you can also put max height on something. 
and keep it from, from expanding. Backgrounds and borders. Backgrounds are another whole bottomless pit that we could go into, but basically you can, you can use colors as backgrounds, you can use uh, color names, hex codes, you can use images, you can use images and colors. Uh, there are some new background properties where you can do a whole bunch of cool things with uh, multiple backgrounds and things like that. You can, in particular when you're using an image, you can specify whether that background image should repeat. So, uh, you know, back in the day when we first coded HTML websites by hand, we would get these little tiny repeatable graphics and you would make it repeat all the way over and all the way down. And, um, and nowadays it's mostly like, oh, I don't want my picture to repeat across or I do want it to go, you know, over but not down. You know, it's, 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 a, it's another property you can set. Background position, again, it really applies to images, not colors and that's going to focus where the focus of your image is starting. So if you put it top left, that top left of your image is always going to be visible. Um, so it, it's a way that you can ensure, if, if not all of your image might be visible on a smaller device, it's a way that you can choose where you want it to be. And you can also actually use percentages and other numbers with this, not just, uh, not just the keywords top, bottom, left, right, center. Background size. Uh, this is a great property, cover or contain. So uh, cover says I want this, I want the entire element to be covered with this image. And that means sometimes some of it will fall over the end, depending on the width or height. And contain says I basically want this whole image to be visible in this element. So it might mean that if you contain it, it's not going to be as long as you think, but you'll see the whole image. Nobody's head's going to get cut off, nobody's going to be off the side of the page. Um, and then border, I just threw in here. Um, borders, you could put borders on anything. In this particular syntax, you're using um, a border width, a style, and a color. This is a combined syntax where we have these three words. And a lot of these things, background in particular, has a combined syntax like this that you'll see when you start looking it up. So instead of using these properties individually, you can also say background and put a bunch of these things together in the right order. It's a little more complicated. It's a little easier to look at them individually, but just know that you might sometimes see uh, what's called a shorthand syntax, and you'll see multiple values in a row put together. CSS uh, properties. So layout and spacing, also very important when you want to add space above or below something, left or right. Um, very, very important. These I put all in pixels. They can all be in percents as well. They have here dash top, bottom, left, right, but you can also, um, like I mentioned in the background, there is a combined syntax where you could just say margin and you can put four values in and they go, they go in the order um, top, right, bottom, left. They go essentially around like a clock. <coughs> Didn't include them here for spacing, but just know that there's some combined syntaxes as well. But if you use these individually, you always know you're going to get the exact side that you are looking for as well. And just a visual on this. Margins versus padding can be a little confusing. So visually, um, you can see here, element is in the middle. And then the closest thing around that is our padding. So if you're using padding, it's going to be right against the element. It's going to be pushing your element over or down. And then if you have a border, that's going to display on the outside of that padding. And then outside of that is going to be your margin. So margin and padding sound kind of similar, and oftentimes you can just throw one on there. But if you have a border on something, it makes a big difference whether you're using margin or padding. And it can make a big difference when it comes to width and things like that, too. So it just, it, just to be aware of this, um, that the padding is on the inside, then your border, and then your margin. WordPress has a lot of classes that come in it that are great to target things. And so I just wanted to include a few of them because my hope is that from this that you'll be able to go and edit your WordPress site and add some basic styling and these classes help you can help you to target the right kind of page to do that with. So these are specifically classes that get applied to the body tag. So that body tag that we talked about, WordPress goes and puts in a bunch of these default tags that tell you what kind of content it is. And they are super helpful when you want to target something. So home, your home page usually has a home class. It'll have a blog class as well if it's your blog page. 
A single post always has a class of single. It has a class of single dash post, and it will have a post ID dash and a post ID. So if you really need to apply a style to just one page, which I try to recommend against, because usually it's not that simple, um, you can use that class. But single dash post, if you have events on your site, you'll see single dash event in there. So it's a way to target one type of content and avoid other kinds. Category, um, you'll see an archive tag in there. You'll see category, category. In this case, I have a, uh, you'll see the slug of the category, so category dash buying. And you'll also see the ID, category dash E. These are all, they're essentially from least specific to most. So archive just says, hey, I'm some kind of archive. I could be anything. In this case, I happen to be of category. Um, so then I see category. Then I happen to be the specific category of buying. And buying and eight are just different ways of expressing that same category. And with page, similarly, you get if there is a page, in this case, the default template applied, you see this class. If there is a, another template applied, you will see a class name that's auto-generated from the name of that template. And that's another way to identify specific pages on your site when you're trying to target your CSS. You'll also see the class page, and you'll also see the page ID. So this is just a smattering. It's just go look in the body tag. If you're trying to only target some pages on your site, start poking around there. It's a great place. So adding CSS to your WordPress website, this question came up earlier ahead of the game. There are a number of ways to add CSS now, and it's a lot easier than it used to be. First of all, ever since 4.7, there is literally a CSS box in the customizer under Appearance, Customize, Additional CSS that you can apply to every single theme. You can write your CSS in there. And as of um, a few versions ago, there's even a parser, and it tells you when you type it wrong. You used to just type it wrong and have to struggle, but now it'll even tell you, like, hey, you wrote that wrong. Um, it won't tell you if you make a typo on the class name, though. <laughs> but it will tell you if your syntax is wrong or that's an invalid value. Um, sometimes your theme has a spot where you can put in CSS. It's kind of redundant at this point because we have the customizer, but, it, but some themes have it. Um, there are plugins such as, uh, I found this one, WP Add Custom CSS, that lets you put it in. Again, kind of redundant now, but some of them, it might have some other features. There's also a visual editor plugin for CSS called, I think, Visual Edit CSS. You don't have to know any CSS to use it, though, so I want you to learn CSS, so. You should try one of these. And then, um, honestly, the best way to put the CSS in, I feel, is to actually add it to your child theme as a CSS file. And, the, and it's more complicated. It involves having a child theme set up, using FTP, putting the styles in there. Um, it's worth doing because what happens when you load your site is that all the CSS that you just add through the customizer, it gets pasted into every page. So it makes every page of your site longer, even though that CSS doesn't necessarily apply to every page. And every, so every page load is a little bigger. Whereas if you put that CSS into an external file, then your browser, when it loads the first page, it loads that external file. When it loads the next page, it's like, oh, I just loaded that file. I already have that. And it doesn't have to load it again. It knows it's the same style. It's not loading your page. And your browser can cache it and know, oh, this page hasn't changed. So I don't need to make another request for it. So, um, but that said, just, just, you can just put it in the additional CSS customizer and then figure out later how to stick it, you know, when you launch into a, a separate file. Browser Inspector. We are going to talk about this in just a minute. So the Browser Inspector is the best tool to learn CSS and play with CSS. It is a tool that comes with every browser. It lets you look at all of the elements on the page, see the styles that they're applied. Um, you can edit CSS on the fly, but your changes are not saved. So when we use the Browser Inspector and type stuff in there and make the text red and make it bigger, well, that's all good, but we need to copy it out and make sure we actually put it in one of those other places for it to apply on the site. But it's a great way to just test it and see how it looks and get it right before we go to the trouble of putting it in and saving it and reloading the page. And they let you see the cascading and inheritance. So you can kind of see where your issues are. Oh, what happens if I add a class here? Oh, that bumps it up. Oh, phew. Now I see my style. So they're a big time saver. And then when you have the styles in there, on a, on at least on Chrome, you can kind of just copy it 
and then you can paste that into your style.css. So very, very helpful. Okay. How are we doing on time? That's the question. installation. Um, it's just local because I don't like to have to rely on conference Wi-Fi. And um, the first thing I really want to show you is the developer tools. So if you come in here, and I'm in Chrome, but this is similar on other browsers. In Chrome, you can come in and go to more tools and hit developer tools. It also actually shows a shortcut there. It says control shift I. Um, you can also hit F12. That's usually what I hit. So. I close this and I hit F12 and it comes up. And this is my inspector down here. And if I'm going to pull it up a little bit, it's not very big. So, um, but I can see here my body class. And I can see all of my classes, I mean, my body tag. And here are all my classes that we talked about. So this is my home page. I'm seeing the home class. I'm seeing the blog class. I see some other stuff like logged in. I could, that's a class I could use if people are logged in to make something special appear um, or disappear or look different. Um, I have the page element. I have some script tags here, which aren't really HTML. They're, they're scripts that appear on the page, but they're not content. If I click and expand this, you can see I start seeing my nested elements. And as I hover over them, it's highlighting things. So this is a header tag, not to be confused with the head tag. And it is showing me this top section um, of the site. And what's cool here is that I can go in here, and I can just keep expanding in. So let's say I wanted to, like, to change this color of this text. I can kind of dig in here, but the other thing I can do is I can use this arrow over here, and I can click this, and then I can hover over things on the page. And you can see as I hover over them, it actually tells me about them. So it tells me their size, it tells me what kind of tag, and then if I choose to click on one, it will change in the inspector to putting me right on that exact tag. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Is that a little better? Yep. Okay. I know, I don't think you in the back will be able to see it, but hopefully you're getting the gist of, of it. So now I can, now I'm seeing this exact anchor tag that is used for this, and I see my href, and then over on the right, what I can see are my styles. So I see dot main dash navigation, dot main menu, um, I see an arrow syntax, which we didn't talk about, but it, it, it means the next, it means directly under that nested element, so not several layers deep, but essentially only one level, L, I, and A. So we're not going to write any CSS that complicated today, but you can see how much more complicated the selectors can get. And we can come in here and we can just say, what does it look like when I make it red? <laughs> that looks horrible. <laughs> and we can change it, um, preferably to a, 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 a code you've actually looked up. Oh, that's not bad for just typing it. Um, so now I've changed this color. Now, if I wanted to apply this style over here, I don't have to understand this exact syntax, because I can just come in here and take this and copy it, and go back over to my, to my dashboard. I'm logged in here. And I can go into the customizer, click on additional CSS, gives me some, some notes and warnings and stuff here. And I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to paste that. Now that's my selector. The next thing I need is my curly brace. So I'm going to type that. WordPress kindly puts in the second curly brace for me. So I'm going to do that. Now I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to just copy just this one declaration that I changed. I don't need all of them. I'm just changing the color. I think the purple is a better color. And I'm going to paste it in here. And then I'm going to hit Publish. And now if I reload my page, I should have that menu color. Yep, and I do, all over the place. So 
if I hadn't moved it over to the customizer, I wouldn't see it there. Um, but let's go, we are short on time here, but we've done a lot of questions as we've gone along, and feel free to come up to me later and hit me up with more questions. I'm happy to hang out and talk more about this. Um, this title here, you can see this is an H2. It's got a class of entry title. I can look over at the CSS over here. Let's bring this up a little bit. Um, and so over on the right here, it's giving me the option to just apply this element dot style. Is, hey, I just want to write a style that's only going to apply to this one specific spot, nothing else. But then down below are the other styles that are applying. So dot entry, dot entry title, margin zero. If I were to, I can actually write a custom style in here by hitting the plus sign. And it's actually going to default to what I've selected. So right now it puts in h2 entry title. And I can, um, let's actually, let's change the font size. So change the font size. It gives me some prompts on some keywords, but I'm just going to go with an actual size. That's actually smaller. That's fine. That's a little nicer, I think. Easier to find. And then if I scroll down the page, I should have other posts down here. And they also now have smaller titles. But this post up here, maybe I only wanted to color this one's title because it's got that sticky designation. It's my featured post. So what I can do is make my inspector a little bigger here. And it can scroll up here. And one of the things I see is this article tag, which wraps just my post. Um, if I collapse it, I can see that it's basically one post on top of the other. I've done this before, so I know it's the article tag. Um, but when I look in the classes here, sure enough, I see a class in here that says sticky. So if I want to, I can make the font smaller, or it probably make more sense to make it bigger. So if I go back to this style where I made it 38, let's make it 68, 78, and maybe we'll give it a funky color. And if I go down the page, of course, I am, oops, sorry, not too quickly. If I go down the page, it's applied to all the titles. But if I just want it to be the sticky title, I can make this style more specific, like we talked about. So I could say dot sticky, and then it's going to change and see how it no longer applies to my hello world. But if I go back up, it's still it's still applying to just my featured one. So what I did there was I looked at those classes that were nested above it to find something that was going to make this unique. And I spelled it right this time. <laughs> so it worked. Um, so yeah, we can do that with the sticky. Another thing that's um, helpful sometimes is if you want to hide things. It's not the perfect way. If you hide things, your browser is still loading them. But sometimes if you don't have a lot of access to the theme, or your client is just like, oh, can you just make that disappear? Um, you know, Let's say your client is like, I really don't want to see who wrote the post. You know, they all say admin, let's just hide this. So I can come in here and look at this part, and I can see, oh, it looks like it's a span tag with the class author and V card. And I can come in here and I can write a new class. Let's have some room up here. Um, when I hit new class, it actually automatically types span.author.v card. So I'm like, well, that's great. That sounds pretty, pretty specific. And I can, I can use the display property, and I can make that none. Good. It's not really the best way to hide things, because if you're hiding big pieces of content, the browser's still loading them, so you're not like saving any performance. But if you just need to make something disappear. Now, of course, we made it disappear, but we didn't make, uh, we didn't make the little person thing disappear. So we maybe were a little too specific. Um, so if I look at that, that looks like that's part of the span class of byline. So if I go back to my author and I actually make this span dot byline, oh, nope, that didn't work. And this is how it goes. <laughs> this, is how it, this is really how it goes. But this is why you use the inspector because you're like, 
that didn't work, but at least I didn't have to put that CSS in the customizer, save it, come back and reload it. Now I just go back and be like, okay, why didn't that work? Did I mistype it? Did I type it wrong? No, I'm just asking, can you just oh. do dot file? I can do dot file. Without the span. I... So now I need to come in and say, what else is going on here? And what's probably going on is that these lower things, yes. So when I go and look right at that icon, I can see over here it says display inline block. And so that's actually like overriding what I'm trying to do. Um, we can try a couple things. So when I come in here, actually, so let's go back and troubleshoot this. So we did expand up byline. We thought it would work. You can see on that right-hand side that display none is crossed out. That means, hey, you put the style in here, and it would have applied, but there's something better. And up at the top, you can see that there's actually a very specific style that says dot entry, dot entry meta, span, um, that's saying display inline block. So I have a couple choices here. Um, I can make my uh, style more specific, or there's also a little bit of a cheat, and I can say, it's important, it's really important that you hide it, and you put an exclamation point and important. Now, don't overuse this. more <laughs> specific. Um, so let me go back. I think I only have one minute, two minutes, zero Sorry. minutes. Okay, so let me go back to the slides. That, um, and just make sure there are any other notes. Um, oh, so an integrated development environment. This is a program that you would use to write CSS. It fixes it for you. It'll tell you what the right properties are. It's great if you're editing site files. If you're just editing CSS, you could probably get away with the additional CSS box. But an IDE is a really powerful tool, and I really recommend them. These are some that are out there that are all free. They're fantastic. I mean, uh, these slides will be posted, so I'm going to just keep clicking through a couple gotchas. You can have a lot of caching on your site. Your browser caches things. Your WordPress site might have a caching plugin. Your host might have caching on the site. Or, of course, your style could be overwritten by something else. So these are all things to look out for. You need to clear the cache everywhere. If you're positive your style is there, Again, and just keep at it. And if you're still not seeing your style, again, if you see it there but it's not applying and you really need to, you can use the important tag. Um, and then these are some other resources of sites where you can learn about HTML and CSS. They're all very tutorial based until the end. Can I use is uh, for browser compatibility. Everything I showed you today is super compatible, but some of the newer stuff rolls out gradually browsers. And then CSS Zen Garden, I highly recommend checking out. It is a site where every page is the same exact content, but with a different style sheet applied. And it looks vastly different. <laughs> every single page. Um, because they're using background images and placement, and you'd never think you're on the same site, but they are all the exact same HTML. So that is it. Thank you very much. questions, but we kind of covered them throughout. So we don't have time for questions now, but um, hit me up at any point. Hit me up at the after party. Find me online. You can find the slides. I will correct them. And thank you very much. <laughs>